Well, good morning. The title of my message today is From Mormonism to Christianity. And in the next few minutes, I'd like to take you on a journey what it was like to be a Latter-day Saint, a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saint, a Mormon, what I believed, uh, what my worldview was, and about how God used Christians in my life and evangelism to bring me from Mormonism to Christianity. I was born and raised Latter-day Saint, fourth generation, baptized at the age of eight years old. It's customary. I received the laying on of hands for what they call the gift of the Holy Ghost and later received the Mormon Aaronic Priesthood, serving in the offices of deacon, teacher, and priest. I also did baptism work for the dead in the uh, Salt Lake City Temple in Utah, something I'll explain more about in just a moment. But right up front, I want you to know, in all my experiences as a Latter-day Saint, I never had an assurance that my sins had been forgiven. So we'll see in just a moment, the Mormon gospel is not good news about grace, it's good news about your ability to keep the law in order to be able to earn your own salvation. And when you serve God by works, you never know if you've done enough. But I was a fortunate, unlike most Mormons probably, I was fortunate that God put some Christian friends in my life to ask me questions, to build friendship, relationship with me, not to bash me. Now, I should tell you right up front, when I was a Mormon, I had some very good experiences with Christians, but I also had some bad experiences. I had some Christians who uh, wanted to bash me or, or attack me or tell me how foolish I was. I had a few Christians who wanted to give me a piece of their mind. Uh, and they probably couldn't even afford uh, to give me a piece of their mind, but that didn't seem to slow them down. But that was the exception. Most of my Christian friends were not that way. They cared about James Walker and they wanted to build a bridge of relationship with me. And I want to take you on that journey. What was it like to be a Mormon? What did I need as far as evangelism for Christians to build a bridge uh, to me? And to help me out, we do have the chart that Mike mentioned to you. This is a map uh, a guide, and if uh, you have that, I want to encourage you to fill in some blanks. I've got uh, inside, we have some resources I'll tell you about in, in, uh, later, but the, uh, on the outside, we have a chart, and there's a fill in the blank here. Did they tell you there's going to be a test? There will be a test. I want these filled in, and this is going to help. This is something for you to keep, and some, also some additional notes on the back, of, the back uh, of that page, something to help you that you can keep uh, when you are able to dialogue or talk with a Mormon. What was it like to be a Mormon? Before I share with you anything out of the Book of Mormon or from the prophet Joseph Smith, let's start with God's Word. Can we do that? Uh, turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 1, verse 6. The Apostle Paul writes to the Christians living in Galatia, and he says to them, I marvel, that's King James for I'm shocked. I, I, you could knock me over. I, I'm shocked at this, he says, that, that you're so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Now, what I want you to notice in verse 6 is that, that the Galatians had, were attracted to the grace gospel. Grace means unmerited favor, undeserved kindness. And this was the gospel, but Paul says that unfortunately they were being distracted away from the grace gospel to a different gospel. Verse 7, it says, which is not another. Now, wait a minute. Is it another gospel or is it not another gospel? Well, of course, the word gospel means good news. And what he's saying is you're going after a different good news, which really ain't good. Uh, there's only one true gospel good news. Every other gospel is not good news at all. It's really bad news. He said, but there would be some that trouble you and would pervert, the word means to twist, the gospel of Christ. And I think verse 8 is the key. But though we or an angel from heaven, if the apostle Paul or the other apostles were to come to, or think about this, what if an angel was to come down to sin? Now, it's interesting, our ministry, Watchman Fellowship, apologetics ministry dealing with primarily reaching people of other faiths, Muslims, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, Scientologists, uh, people in Wicca, the occult. And it's interesting the number of religions that began with the appearance of an angel. I could go through and list and talk about that. Islam with the angel Jibril or Gabriel appearing to Muhammad in the cave of Hara. With, with Mormonism, you have the angel Moroni appearing in Joseph Smith's bedroom in 1823, telling him about another scripture called the Book of Mormon recorded on sacred golden plates. But, but, but the key is this. Even if it's an angel that comes to you, if that gospel does not match the gospel of grace, well, look at verse 8. Here's the answer. 
uh, uh, an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto, unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. So what we see is there's only one true gospel. Any other good news, no matter how appealing it is, no, or how attractive, uh, no matter how, uh, then even if an angel brings it to you, we're to reject that because the messenger is actually under a divine curse. Now, as a Mormon, I thought I believed the gospel. And one of the things we're going to see is they use our words. Mormons use Christian vocabulary. They use our vocabulary. Unfortunately, they have their own dictionary. So they have different definitions for the word. So when I say I would believe the gospel as a Mormon, I believe the gospel, I believe the restored gospel. Now, I called it the restored gospel. Mormons do that because we were taught as Mormons that Joseph Smith had to restore the gospel. Joseph Smith said that he didn't know what church he ought to join. In fact, the Mormon scriptures mentioned the Baptist, Presbyterian, and Methodist. He didn't know if he should join those churches or some other church. So he prays and asks God, and the Mormon scriptures record that Jesus and God both appeared to him, and God the Father and his son Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ told him there was no true Christian gospel on the earth, no true Christian church. It had disappeared after the first century, and Joseph Smith had to restore the gospel. Now, when you restore something, obviously, it's... a a restoration matches the original, right? For example, restoration. I love classic cars. Now, I'm not going to show you any pictures of my grandchildren, but I got to show you this 1957 Chevy. Guys, am I right? There's nothing like a 1957 Chevy. So let's say that because of a, a labor of love, now this is, this is love, I, and I'm not saying it's agape, but it's close. And let's say I'm going to take this 1957 Chevy and I'm going to invest, and it's an investment. A small fortune because I want everything the headliner the upholstery a blueprint the engine every lug nut everything original pristine factory and so I finally three uh, years later and a small fortune later uh, I'm finished with the restoration I invite you to my backyard for a party and show you my restored 1957 Chevy and you say James we got to talk now I could argue that I spent a lot of time and money on the project but see the issue is not how sincere I am it's not how much money I've given to the project or how much I believe it's true. It's, that's a Winnebago. That's not a 1957 Chevy. That's what Paul's saying. If it's not the same as the grace gospel, you've got a motorhome. You don't have the real gospel. And so I want to take you on that journey. Look at your chart with me. The Mormon restored gospel called the law of eternal progression basically answers three questions. And let me say up front, these are good questions. These are great questions that you can be in discussion with anyone at Starbucks or wherever you might be encountering someone at the workplace or uh, out in the community at the, at the mall. The questions are these. Uh, question one, where do we come from? Question two, why are we here? What's the purpose of life? What does God expect of us? And question three, where are we going? Which is another way of saying what happens to us after we die. Now the Mormons have some answers to these questions. And they're, they're very interesting answers. And some would even argue attractive answers. But remember as we look at the answers, the question is not, is this attractive or interesting? No, the question is, is this the grace gospel found in the New Testament, or do we have actually a different gospel? Well, if you look at the chart, question one is in an arrow, and that's your big clue. The arrow is pointing to the answer. In the upper left-hand corner of your chart, I was taught, where do we come from? Far away, on a distant part of the universe, the Mormon scriptures, the Pearl of Great Price book of Abraham says there's a star called Kolob. And our Heavenly Father lives nearest, the, the celestial residence of our Heavenly Father is near this star, Kolob. God lives near this star called Kolob. It's a thousand times larger than our sun. And God lives there, lives near there. His name is Elohim, which is a Hebrew word meaning either God's, God or God's. And I was taught this was the personal name of our Father in heaven. Heavenly Father Elohim lives there on a planet near the star Kolob. Now on the chart we have this picture for you as a planet called the first estate or the other name for it is the pre-existence. The pre-existence. And Heavenly Father lives there near the star called Kolob. And Heavenly Father lives on the planet near the star Kolob along with Heavenly Mother. Now we're starting to think way outside the box here. I was taught as a Mormon that God is married. In, heaven, in uh, Mormonism, you have not only Heavenly Father, you have His wife, Heavenly Mother. You've got God and you've got uh, Mrs. God. 
I know some of you are thinking this. Now, wait a minute, James. Where, how could they arrive at this? How could Mormons think this? That's not in the Bible. In the Bible, God's not married. Well, actually, technically, in the Bible, uh, God's not even dating anybody. So wh where's this coming from? Well, one of the flaws of, of counterfeit Christianity is they'll look to other sources of truth outside the Bible. So as Mormons, we had Latter-day Apostles and prophets who could uh, deliver new doctrine, new scripture. We had new scriptures like the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, Pearl of Great Price. Once you begin to say that there's mistakes in the Bible, which the Mormon church teaches it's not been translated correctly, once you do that and you begin to look for other sources, let me tell you, you can believe anything to be true. And so I believed in Heavenly Father, His wife, Heavenly Mother, and I was taught and believed that God and His wife uh, have babies, spirit children. Now, just like human parents procreate a family, uh, sons and daughters, our Heavenly Father, along with His wife, Heavenly Mother, well, they, they procreate spirit children. Now, God has a lot of spirit children. Uh, he, he doesn't have millions. He, he actually has billions. Now, we're, we're striking right at the heart now of question one. What, what's question one? Where did we come from? Now, I was taught as a Mormon that all of us in the building this morning, everyone who's currently alive on earth today, everyone who ever has been born in history past, anyone who will ever be born in the future history, where did we come from? We came from the pre-existence. We are the spirit children of these divine parents. Uh, we look a lot like we do now, except we had spirit bodies rather than tangible bodies of flesh and bone. Nevertheless, we look like we do now. We were the same people that we are now. This is not reincarnation. I, I was taught as a Mormon that, um, well, let me say this way. If I was a Mormon, I might ask you this question. Raise your hand. How many of you, it's like odd, it's strange. You meet someone for the first time, it, but it's uncanny. It's like you had known this person your entire life. Raise your hand if you've ever experienced that before. Well, see, ma'am, you probably knew that person here on the planet near the star Kolob. Okay, she's not convinced. But you can see how some, this might be appealing or it might be a deja vu or something. But remember what the scriptures warn. This is not about deja vu or you're not, it's not even about is this plausible. No, is this biblical? Is this the same gospel or is it in fact a different gospel? Now I was taught it was determined we would need a savior. And two of our older brothers both offered to be the savior of our earth. Jesus said, I will be the savior of mankind. But his spirit brother also offered to be savior. His name was Lucifer. Jesus, I was taught, and Lucifer are spirit brothers. Jesus was chosen to be the savior rather than his brother Lucifer. Otherwise, we would have a different savior today. I was taught as a Latter-day Saint, this is where we come from. And this basically answers question one, where did we come from? And it takes us now to question number two, why are we here? Well, this is the bottom left-hand corner of your chart. We're here on earth, okay, you with me on that? Earth, which is also called the second estate. First estate's pre-existence. We're here on earth, which is second estate. By the way, one year we published this uh, a chart similar to this in one of our magazines. And the woman who did the graphic art for us, she put a little X by the earth and put, you are here. You ever get lost at the mall? If I have lost you, you're on earth, okay? which is also known as the second estate. But why? Well, I was taught as a Mormon that there are very important reasons that we're here. Reasons that we must, uh, that God placed us here in order to progress. This is the law of eternal progression. We couldn't progress in the previous estate. So we're here on earth, and there's probably dozens of important things that we're here for, but I've reduced it to nine basic reasons. Here's what I was taught. Number one, this is in the white box. Why are we here? Number one, we have to receive a body of flesh and bone. We could not progress with a spirit body. We must gain a physical body of flesh and bone. Let me just get a feel for the group this morning. How many of you have already accomplished step one, you've gained a body? Because <laughs> about half of us, now Mike, I don't know if I can work with this group. It should be almost all of us get a body, okay? Number two, you must be put into an environment where you can experience sin. Uh, you have to have free agency in order to choose sin. We could not choose sin in the pre-existence. We're now on earth where we obviously have chosen to sin, all have sinned, and so we can experience sin. We'll have to repent of that sin. Number three, we must have faith in Christ. Now here's something we can all have a commonality with our Mormon neighbors and friends. 
Uh, the Mormons believe that faith in Christ is part of the gospel. And we would agree that faith, well, we would say faith in Christ is the totality of the gospel, but they would say at least it's part of the gospel. But it begs the question, which Christ? Now, you know, almost every religion believes in, a, in some kind of Jesus. I, I wrote a book we have available, The Concise Guide of Today's Religions and Spirituality. We have the key facts and definitions of over 1,700 religions in America. Virtually all, there's a few, but virtually all of the religions believe in Jesus of some kind. But the issue is not do you believe in Jesus. There's no record in the Gospels of Jesus ever asking his disciples, Hey, fellows, do people believe I exist? That was never the question. The question was what? Who do men say that I am? See, that's the issue. And so, as Latter-day Saints do believe in Jesus, when I was a Mormon, I would tell you, the name of our church is even the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 4, warns, though, about those who would preach another Jesus, not the Jesus of Scripture. I was taught a Jesus of Mormonism that is not the same as the Jesus I believe in today. I currently believe in the traditional Jesus, the traditional Christ. The Mormon Jesus is not the eternal God made flesh, not the second person of the Trinity. Uh, the Jesus of Mormonism is the spirit brother of Lucifer, uh, who um, was married to three women, Mary, her sister Martha, and Mary Magdalene, who... Um, after, uh, who, uh, after his death on the cross and resurrection, the Book of Mormon recounts that Jesus came here to America to preach his gospel to the Native Americans, uh, to the Indians, who are actually Jewish according to the Book of Mormon. I'll address that later on in my workshop. Are Indians really Jewish? Shalom Kimosabi. Short answer is no on that one, in case you can't make the seminar. But uh, bottom line is, is this the same Jesus that we believe in? It's not. Now, our Mormon friends are sincere and dedicated and hardworking, but you have to have the right Jesus. Faith in Christ is not alone if it's the wrong Christ. Now, I don't want you to take my word for this. I want to take you to the top Mormon himself. This is Gordon B. Hinckley, prophet, seer, revelator. Uh, recently, he passed away just a few years ago. This was a very recent, the, the, the previous prophet of the church, leader of the church, had this to say in the LDS uh, Latter-day Saints uh, uh, Church News. In bearing testimony of Jesus Christ, President Hinckley spoke of those outside the church who say Latter-day Saints do not believe in the traditional Christ. Listen to his answer. No, I don't. The traditional Christ of whom they speak is not the Christ of whom I speak. Now, this is important to understand is you're talking to your Mormon neighbor or friend. How many of you know a Mormon? You could tell me the name of a Mormon right now. You need to understand as you're, as you're dialoguing, as you're building that friendship, that relationship with that Mormon neighbor or coworker, that friend. Some of us, you're talking family here. When you talk about Jesus, they're convinced that they believe in the same Jesus that we do. They either don't understand the differences or they think the differences are minor, and are, are not significant differences. But if you go to the top Mormon, he knows. When you go to their own prophet, he understands that the Jesus he believes in is different. Now, if you read the whole article, he's going to argue that we have the wrong Jesus and that he has the right Jesus. But at least he acknowledges there's a distinction. And so when we're sharing the gospel, it's so important that we define terms. You see, uh, maybe you could get away with not having to do that back in the Bible Belt in the 1950s or 60s, where everybody pretty much had a biblical worldview, and we, mean, we meant the same thing when we said scripture or heaven or gospel or Bible. We had the, we had the same dictionary. Those days are gone. And so what we have to do, I'm convinced that apologetics is the future of all evangelism. We've got to bridge not only the issue of sin and salvation through Christ, we've got to bridge terminology differences. It's cross-cultural. And we've got to help Christians, uh, help Mormons understand that we as Christians, when we say Jesus, we're not talking about necessarily the same Jesus that they are. Number four on the list, you have to repent of your sin. I mentioned earlier, repentance. Number four, baptism. But for the baptism to be valid, it must be by a Mormon priesthood holder. Number six, receive the Holy Ghost by laying on of hands. It's part of the gospel. Number seven, you must obey the laws of the gospel. Now, this is why I say this is not the grace gospel. It's the law gospel. You're saved in Mormonism by your own obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel. 
This was the final step for me to come out of Mormonism when I realized that I wasn't keeping all the laws. I didn't even know all the, you know there's 613 laws just in the Old Testament, forgetting all the other scriptures. I didn't even know all the laws, but the ones I knew I had trouble with. And so no one is saved by keeping the laws. Joseph Smith said that's how a person's saved, by your obedience to laws and orders. The Book of Mormon says it this way. By grace are we saved after all you can do. Let me ask you, have you ever gone to bed thinking I did everything I could do? See, that's an impossible gospel. And some of our Mormon neighbors or friends are struggling with that. You say, well, James, they're such good people. You would be too if your salvation was hanging in the balance. And they're trying and striving. But the honest Mormon goes to bed knowing in his heart, in her heart, that she's not really done. He's not done everything that they could do. That's why when I realized as a Mormon, I needed help. I needed a Savior. And while I knew in my head that Jesus was the Savior, I had never been tr taught in Mormonism to put my trust in Christ as Savior. I was trusting James Walker and my own obedience to the law of eternal progression. Number eight, you must become temple worthy. This is another work salvation. There's only about 130 Mormon temples in the world and most Mormons have never been inside one. See, salvation requires, full salvation requires going to the temple, but most Mormons don't qualify to get inside the temple. You must qualify through your good works. You must be a full tithe payer in order to go into the temple. You can't drink coffee or tea, alcoholic beverages, tobacco. Uh, there's a long set of rules and regulations. Once you do qualify to go inside, you get into the temple, there's several important things that happen there that cannot happen outside uh, in any other building. One of them is to be married to your spouse for time and all eternity. Their marriage in the temple is not till death do you part. Now, if I could tell you this morning, there is a way, how many of you are married? Raise your hand. If I could tell you a way to be married, not just till death, but for all eternity, how many of you would be interested in that? <laughs> okay, you, you probably didn't understand the question. What I mean, <laughs> strike that question. Here, one of the big advantages as a Mormon, I thought, is that our marriages are not till death if they're in the temple. Also, baptism for the dead is important. That happens in the temple as well. But let's, let's go ahead and jump to that last thing, the last point. Where are we going? I was taught that after death, everyone is going to go to one of two places, and it's not heaven, and it's not hell. Where are we going? Well, you're going to go either to paradise or spirit prison. Now, the shortcut answer, and we have more information on our website at watchman.org. We've got more information on the back of that chart, but short answer. Only worthy Latter-day Saints go to paradise. Everyone else goes to spirit prison. However, spirit prison, there's a, uh, a possible good side to this because if you've never understood the Mormon gospel, you never had the Mormon missionaries share this with you, and so you die without knowing the restored gospel, the law of eternal progression, and you're in spirit prison. I was taught Mormon missionaries from paradise can actually come down and share the Mormon gospel with you in spirit prison. So there's a way you can actually accept the restored gospel post-mortem after death. Now, if you do accept the gospel, you still can't go to paradise because remember, you've not been baptized. You say, well, I've been baptized. Yes, but not by one having the proper authority, meaning a Mormon elder. This is where the doctrine of baptism for the dead comes in. Mormons have millions of names of deceased people. And those names are sent electronically to one of the 130 or so Mormon temples in the world. This is what I did in the Salt Lake City Temple in Utah. I was dressed in total white from head to toe, ushered into a room in the temple. In the center of the room, there was a gold baptismal font supported by 12 golden oxen. I stepped down into that baptismal font and was baptized, not for me, I'd already been baptized. I was baptized for dead people. One of them, Frederick Jones. And I was convinced had Frederick Jones received the restored gospel in spirit prison, he then could go up to paradise. Not only do they do baptism for the dead, they also do marriage for the dead, where living Mormon couples stand in on behalf of dead couples to do uh, marriage ceremonies for and on behalf of the dead couples so they could be married in eternity. 90% of what happens in the temple, temples are works for dead people. And this is an uh, important part of the gospel. But even if you make it a paradise, it's not over. On the right-hand side of your chart, you'll see that eventually, virtually everyone is going to go 
to one of three different heavens. The bottom heaven is known as the telestial kingdom, represented by the glory of the stars. Now, this is a heaven which I was taught is beautiful and marvelous and majestic and everything you could imagine heaven would be. But I had no desire to go to this heaven. There's a higher heaven above that called the terrestrial kingdom, represented by the glory of the moon. Now, notice the light gets brighter. The twinkle of the stars replaced by the glow of the moon. And this was a more beautiful uh, uh, heaven, uh, a more uh, worthy place to go. But as you can already imagine, I had no desire to go there either. My goal in life as a Latter-day Saint was to be worthy to go to the celestial kingdom. That was the highest heaven represented by the glory of the sun. Now I'm going to simplify this for you. Basically, it works this way. Only worthy Latter-day Saints go to the celestial kingdom or those who accept the restored gospel after death in spirit prison and wait for their works to be done for them by Mormon temples by proxy uh, works for the dead. The bottom king, and this is interesting, the bottom heaven is reserved for wicked people. If you're a murderer, lawless, you hate God, you don't have to be spiritual or anything to go to the bottom heaven. The middle heaven is for spiritual people, honorable men and women, who are not Latter-day Saints. So maybe uh, if you are an observant Jew, if you are a devout Muslim, if you're a good Baptist, you can go to that middle heaven. Now there's one other place in the bottom middle of the page, outer darkness, which is a bad place. But don't worry, you can't go there unless first you're Mormon. As long as you never join the Mormon church, you're guaranteed one of the heavens. Once you join the Mormon church, now you're at risk. You can go to outer darkness, even though at my excommunication trial, my bishop assured me that even doing the ministry that I'm doing at Watchman Fellowship and uh, being an enemy of Joseph Smith and the restored gospel, I still was not a son of perdition because I did not believe it with all my heart. He said, Brother Walker, you can still make it to the bottom kingdom with the wicked people. So there's some salvation even for James Walker in the Mormon system of things. But I wanted to go, when I was Mormon, to that celestial kingdom. But if you look closely at your chart, even the celestial kingdom is divided into three categories. In order to make it the highest degree of the celestial kingdom, not only must you be LDS, a Latter-day Saint, Mormon, not only must you be worthy, not only must you have done the temple works, you must also be married and your spouse must be worthy also. If you are single, you can go to the celestial kingdom as a servant or slave, but you cannot go to the highest degree of the celestial kingdom. So your marital status, I was just ask, how many of you are single? Raise your hand if you're single. I just need to ask you this morning, do you like anybody? Now you need to think about this because your marital status is going to play a part in the gospel. You can't be single and be in the highest kingdom. But if you do make it to the highest kingdom and you're, you're married and your spouse is worthy also, it's still not over because this is the law of eternal progression. Now remember question one formed an arrow from the upper right-hand corner of your chart to the upper left-hand corner of your chart? That arrow represents if you make it to the highest degree of the celestial kingdom, you and your spouse will be then given your own earth somewhere. And you and your wife, you and your husband are going to be the heavenly father and the heavenly mother of the new earth and you are going to start having babies, billions of them. And you're, you're gonna populate this new earth with your own spirit offspring who will look to you as their heavenly father and heavenly mother. Now, interestingly, the chart also works in reverse. That arrow flips around. It, I was taught that our Heavenly Father, our God, before he was the God over our earth, he used to be a man himself somewhere on some other planet, but apparently he was such a good man when he died, the other gods allowed him to become a new God. That's how he got to be the God of our earth. One of the prophets of the Mormon church, Lorenzo Snow, summarized the entire Mormon gospel with this most famous couplet, and it goes like this. He explained the gospel, quote, as man is, God once was, as God is, man may become. This is the Mormon gospel. This is the law of eternal progression. Let me ask you, is this the same gospel found in the pages of the New Testament or do we have a different gospel? Now, again, I was fortunate enough to have some Christian friends who shared with me. There was a series of events that God used over a period of a number of years in my life. Uh, I remember the first time someone showed me 
as a Mormon some of the 4,000 changes that have taken place in the Book of Mormon. I, I, in my seminar uh, this, this afternoon, I'm going to teach you, show you how you can sit down with a Latter-day Saint with photocopies of the actual original Book of Mormon showing some of the 4,000 changes. I was devastated by this. I had been told the Bible had been changed millions of places, but the Book of Mormon was the most correct of any book on earth. And when I saw that with my own two eyes, I began to wonder, what else has my church told me that ends up not being true? I, there were other things. Two of my sisters became Christians before me. And the whole family saw a wonderful difference that took place in their life. But it, it was um, counterintuitive because they had left the true church and now they were going to a Christian church, a Baptist church, but their lives were so radically changed by the gospel. There were other issues as well. Uh, the final issue with me was grace because I realized even on my best day, I was not doing all that I could do. One of the Mormon prophets, Spencer W. Kimball, says that repentance is required for salvation. And repentance means that you must never repeat the sin again. And for repentance to be true, you cannot repeat the sin, not even in your mind, or you've never truly repented. Or if you haven't repented, you haven't had the gospel. And so Mormons, a lot of Mormons you meet are wrestling with this. It's, a, uh, it's an oppression and a bondage that they're in. And they need some good news of the gospel. There were many things that happened on my journey from Mormonism to Christianity, but let me take you back to the very first experience. Let me tell you about the first Christian to ever build a bridge of relationship with me. It was actually a friend named Tommy in seventh grade. Seventh grader, and he asked me, James, he said, what church do you go to? He's my friend, he asked me, and I said, well, I, I'm a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And Tommy said, well, that's good. Now, it took Tommy a couple of weeks. But a few weeks later, Tommy came back, he said, James, you're a Mormon. <laughs> I said, well, that's like another name for our church. I'll never forget what Tommy said. Tommy said, you guys believe in a different God than the God we believe in. I said, oh no, Tommy, we believe in God and Jesus and the Bible the same as you do. We just have some additional information, uh, like the Book of Mormon. Tommy said, no. He said, James, actually, I looked you up in the encyclopedia. I said, we're in the encyclopedia? What does it say? He says, well, it says in the encyclopedia, your church teaches that God, before he was God, he was once a man, and that you too can become a God yourself one day. I said, oh, okay, now I know the problem. You, what, what, what we mean by that is you have to be worthy in order to earn the right to become uh, like our Heavenly Father. We believe that the same as your church. See, I thought all the churches taught that. And Tommy said, oh no, we only believe in one God. I said, yeah, one God for our earth, but you know, there's other earths with other gods. And my friend Tommy, seventh grade, he said, no, Tom, no, James, the Bible says there's only one true God. Every other God is a false God. I said, Tommy, where'd you hear that? And he showed me Isaiah 43.10 where the word of God says, before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. And Tommy just said, James, if there's no God formed before God, how could God have once been a man? And if there's no God that's going to be formed after God, how can you ever become a God yourself one day? I didn't know the answer to that question. I'm thinking that's one of the mistakes in the Bible. But the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And I still remember that day. I still remember that verse. And God began to work on my life. I didn't become a Christian that day or that week or that month or that year or five years or 10 years. But God planted a seed that day with my friend Tommy that helped me realize that we're saved by grace and not by works. That the real Jesus is fully God and fully man and that I need to repent of my sins and trust Jesus as Savior and not rely in any, in any part on James Walker as my Savior. Well, I did want to mention to you that uh, one of the things that we want to do being here in New Mexico is our ministry, Watchman Fellowship, wants to partner with churches here in New Mexico. We minister all over the country, but we've done not that much at all here in New Mexico. We want to offer resources and tools. My staff stands with you to come out here and train and teach in your churches. Some other resources that we have available, if you look inside your chart, 
Uh, we have uh, a book, we have a great set of DVDs on Islam, Mormonism, cults, Scientology, some great tools and resources. We've got some great specials on that. One of the tools that we have is a free profile that we do. Uh, it's a uh, uh, bi-monthly, every other month, a four-page fact sheet that every other month we deal with a different religion or controversial doctrine or practice, it's free. If you'll just uh, print up your name and address on the top of that form and turn it into our resource table out there in the lobby area, we'd love to get a free subscription. That's a way that we can minister to you, equip you and train you. Uh, and we've got some good resources. You may say, James, I'd love to reach my Mormon friend. I raised my hand. I'm concerned about this Mormon, but I don't have the tools. I don't have the resources. We have resources. We have the tools for you, but let me be right, quite frank with you. It's really not about the resources. It's really about relationship and it's about willingness. Now my friend Tommy, what did he have? An encyclopedia and a King James Bible. That's all he had. Are you smarter than a 12 year old? Or how does that go? I don't know, is that a 13 year old? Whatever that. Eighth grader, are you smarter than eighth grader? That's how it goes. Are you smarter than eighth grader? It, it's not about how smart you are, resources. Uh, I think resources help, but really it's about God's more interested in availability than he is ability. And as an evangelism conference like this, as we, as we look at 2012 and say, what are we going to do as New Testament churches, as, as Southern Baptist churches in the state of New Mexico? Are we going to make a difference? Are we going to be salt and light? It's really about attitude and it's commitment. It's a matter of the will. Are we going to love God? Are we going to love people? I lost track of my friend Tommy shortly after the ninth grade. I'll close with this. I lost track of my friend Tommy. And Tommy would have never known the rest of the story were it not many, many years later, one year for a birthday present, my wife decided to do something different for birthday present. Her, her birthday present that year for me, she somehow tracked down and found my friend Tommy from seventh grade, got him on the phone for me. That was my birthday present. Remember your Mormon friend back in junior high, James Walker? He's a Christian now. He has a ministry, Watchman Fellowship, reaching Mormons and Muslims and Jehovah's Witnesses and Wiccans and occultists. And remember that day when you shared the Bible verse with him? God used that. You planted a seed. You crossed over that bridge. You built that relationship. You know what I want to be when I grow up? I finally decided I want to be a Tommy. How many Tommies do we have here this morning? I want to be a Tommy. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for the truth of the gospel. Help us to be able to love our neighbors, our, our classmates, our coworkers. Help us to reach New Mexico with the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm thankful that you placed a Tommy in my life. Don't let it in there, Lord. Let me be a Tommy to countless others. And let us all do that in Jesus' name. Amen.